In the previous lessons, you've learned a few things about metals and nonmetals. You've learned that metals are characterized by having electrons that are free to roam around between the positively charged atomic cores. We call that the sea of electrons, and it gives metals their properties like malleability, conductivity, even their density. You also learned that nonmetals are characterized as having electrons that are tied up in covalent bonds between the atoms. Those electrons are far less likely to move around because they're in these stable bonds. Also, some nonmetals already just have all of the electrons around the outside that they need, so they don't bond with anything else. Regardless, you learned that because in nonmetals, either the atoms or the molecules tend not to bond with one another, it gives nonmetals their properties, like their very low densities and melting and boiling points, their inability to conduct an electric current. Those are the sorts of properties that we've learned about so far. But what if there was a type of substance that was in between? right in between the metals and the nonmetals. How would the electrons in that substance behave and what properties would it give to that substance? That's what we're going to be looking into in today's lesson as we explore the metalloids, the group of elements that's between the metals and the nonmetals. First off, let me show you where they are in the periodic table. Here again are most of the regions of the periodic table. I'm going to gray out the regions that are not metalloids to show you where the metalloids are. And we're actually going to take a look at one very common metalloid to begin. Let's take a look at silicon to see how the electrons in metalloids are arranged. Metalloids are characterized by having a halfway or partway filled outer shell. The metalloids have between three and six electrons in their outer shell. And remember that octet rule says they all want to have eight electrons in their outer shell to be stable. Now there's a couple of ways that atoms that have a medium number of electrons in their outer shell can make a full outer shell. One way is to form ions. And actually metalloids can form positive or negative ions. They can go either way. This silicon atom can lose four of its electrons and make a positive ion with a four plus charge, but it's very difficult for any atom to give up that many electrons. The more electrons an atom has to gain or lose, the more difficult it is for that atom to do it. On the other hand, it could, instead of losing four electrons, it could gain four extra electrons, and now it has eight in its outer energy level as well. So either way would give the atom eight electrons in its outer energy level. It could either shed the four electrons it currently has, so the eight underneath that are on the outside, or it can gain four more. However, that's a very difficult thing for any atom to do. That's a lot of electrons to gain or lose. There's another way that a metalloid atom like silicon can get eight electrons in its outer shell and it's by sharing electrons covalently. So here I have the atomic core. It has protons, neutrons, and electrons in it, but it has four or more protons, and here's the outer energy level of electrons. Now that I have the core, which has four extra protons, and the four outer electrons, this is a stable atom of silicon. I'm going to add another atom of silicon nearby. Notice they're sharing one pair of electrons, but neither of them yet has eight electrons in their outer shell. What if that original silicon, though, shared one pair on each side? It would form a type of bond that we've looked at before called a covalent network bond, where it's sharing pairs of electrons all around itself. Notice that the inner silicon atoms have eight electrons around the outside by sharing one pair on each side. Now here's what that causes to happen. This is a strongly bonded together substance because those network bonds are pulling on all sides holding the substance together. Another way to think of this is that the outer energy levels are overlapping so the atoms are stuck together by sharing those pairs of electrons between them. And what this causes is it causes silicon to form a very well-bonded crystal element. 
you can see the crystal lattice in the background. Let me just show you one more thing. I want to highlight that there are covalent bonds between all of these atoms. Covalently bonded pairs of electrons aren't really free to move around very much at all, which gives this substance the same kinds of properties that nonmetals have. But look at this as well. If I remove the outer shell so we can look at the inside, do you notice that it almost looks like there's a sea of electrons between these atom cores? Doesn't this look a lot like a metal as well with the sea of electrons pulling the atoms together in all directions? That's what makes a metalloid have some properties of metals and nonmetals because the electrons are kind of arranged like they are in a metal, but also kind of like they are in a nonmetal. So now let's look at some of the properties that the metalloids have because of this arrangement. And here I'm going to bring in the element arsenic, which is a metalloid that's shiny and looks almost like a metal, but doesn't behave like a metal. For example, when you pound arsenic with a hammer, it shatters it into pieces instead of pounding it into flat sheets. Arsenic is brittle, like all nonmetals. It's not malleable like metals would be. Other characteristics, metalloids don't really conduct electricity very well. Now they kind of conduct electricity, but it's much more difficult for those electrons that are held tightly in covalent bonds between atoms to just move through a wire from one place to another. You can make metalloids better conductors by performing chemical processes on them, and that's what we do in computer chips. We make special metalloid semiconductors that do all sorts of amazing things. But metalloids themselves aren't very good conductors of electricity. However, they are, in general, pretty good conductors of heat, which is because the atoms are so neatly lined up that they easily will transmit those vibrations from one atom to the next. Another characteristic of metalloids that you may not expect is that they're shiny like metals are shiny. When light hits them, there's plenty of electrons available for the electrons to just jump up and then fall back down and release the energy back the way that they came. However, even though they have a reflective surface, metalloids are typically duller than actual metals because they're so brittle that their surface is rarely ever perfectly smooth like the surface of metals. Therefore, they're much more likely to reflect light back at different angles instead of reflecting it perfectly straight the way it came in. And then finally, the last property of metalloids is that they have fairly high densities and very high melting and boiling points. And again, we can attribute that to the strength of the covalent network bonds between the atoms. Those atoms are held together by pairs of electrons that are tightly in place, holding the crystal arrangement tightly in place. So now you know the properties of metalloids and how metalloids are kind of like metals with their sea of electrons, sort of, but kind of like nonmetals because of their covalent bonds.